Let's uh, get to this morning's uh, sermon. And I think I put a slide in there for this. Yeah, I just forgot to put everything else into it. So, but there's the scripture uh, this morning's, which is good because if you notice the little worship bulletin on the back, I misspelled the word skepticism, which, or you could doubt that I misspelled it, but it is actually, that was supposed to be funny. You doubt my skepticism. Oh, you got it? Okay, there you go. We're going to talk a little bit about skepticism this morning because it's part, I think, of this passage. And, uh, and many of us feel skeptical, you know. Um, at the beginning of the week, you might have felt skeptical about the outcome of the week. Okay, who knows? Uh, maybe you were hopeful. Uh, maybe you were not so hopeful. Maybe you're skeptical about what's happening. But the most important thing is, Skepticism is part of life. So let's read this passage, see what I'm talking about here. Hopefully it'll make sense. Starting at verse 1 of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were there washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Then I hear skepticism here. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch fish for people. Is that right? You will fish for people. Uh, My dyslexia is showing up. So they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. You know, I I just love Simon Peter's attitude. You know, go out, drop your nets over. You know, we've worked all night. Rabbi, Jesus, teacher, master. It's kind of like, a lot of people look at academics. People who teach, we know, didn't do. And so we have a healthy skepticism of people who teach us and tell us what to do and what to think and how to act and how to live. And this Jesus, who is still pretty unknown, gets into this fisherman's boat and tells the fisherman how to fish. And I think Simon is just being perfectly Simon. You know, we've been out all night, worked hard all night. But just because you say so, we'll drop the nets. Much to Simon's surprise, Jesus knew what he was talking about. You know, life for us as Christians sometimes is challenging because we don't always get or see or understand what is what God is doing. We read promises in the scriptures. We hear preachers preach promises, tell us how God acts, and yet somehow that doesn't always translate into our lives, or at least we don't always understand them. And so we doubt and we become skeptical. Some people are just born skeptical. 
Yesterday, Amy and I were driving into town, and she said something, and I said, I'm happy. She <laughs> starts laughing. No, you're grumpy. <laughs> you know, well, okay. You know, I'm happy right now. No, you're still grumpy inside. <laughs> okay. I'm a happy grump, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> one day at a time. So, but, you know, we are what we are, and we can't change that. God can. He can certainly mold us and change us over a period of time. But there are people who are the half-empty glass kind of people, aren't they? And, you know, it's, it's always kind of dark in their world. And there are some people that are just naturally skeptical. And I think that that's a good place to be in one regard. There are people who are overly optimistic. Those people make me crazy. You know, and I always have to smile and be nice. And inside, I'm just spinning away thinking, we'll see. I went to the, script, or to the dictionary and, and found the definition for skepticism. An attitude of doubt or a disposition to incredulity either in general or towards a particular object. Secondly, the doctrine that true knowledge or knowledge in a particular area is uncertain. And there's a second uh, half of that. The method of suspended judgment, systematic doubt, or criticism characteristic of skeptics. And then third, doubt concerning basic religious principles as immortality, providence, and revelation. Right now, it seems in our society, in our world, there's a lot of religious skepticism that it's popular right now. But I would also remind you that there are people who are politically skeptic, skeptical. There are people who have skepticism about climate change. There are philosophical uh, skeptics, and there are certainly financial skeptics. Uh, people who, who practice skepticism. But this morning I want us to talk about Jesus, our faith, and a healthy understanding. How to approach life. How to be a Christian in this world and how to deal with difficult, sometimes thorny issues. Now, I think there are a number of areas in which we become skeptical. There's a skepticism of Jesus' authority, power, and person. Okay? This illustration this morning from Simon, who is Simon Peter, Peter who ends up following Jesus to his last day. Peter who chose when he was being persecuted and being put to death upon a cross, asked that he be hung upside down so that he wouldn't emulate. Jesus' crucifixion. This Peter went all the way because he fully, completely, absolutely trusted Jesus. But that wasn't always the case. Peter didn't always trust Jesus. You know, sometimes I think we have this sort of childlike Sunday school mentality that, you know, like, I hope I'm giving my kids. I want them to have this. But at some point, you have to grow up and grow out of your Sunday school perspective, your rose-colored glasses about who Jesus really is. And I love the Jesus of the Bible. I love the little song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I love the simplicity of that. But this world is complex, life is complex, and how does Jesus deal with it? And here's the thing. I haven't always been a man of faith the way I would like to be because I was immature. I needed to grow. Just like Peter, my first experiences of Jesus weren't always on point with who he was and is. And I would say that even as a mature, very well-educated Christian, it's not always right either. There has to be a sense of humility within us as people of faith to say, I don't 
know everything. But how do we approach most people? We are already prepared. You know the number one reason why we can't remember names when somebody tells us a name? Number one reason is because we're already thinking about how we're going to answer that person. We aren't thinking in the moment. We're thinking past the moment. We're thinking into what we want to project into that person and how we want to project ourselves. Jesus encounters Peter for the first time in this boat in a real way and demonstrates to him part of who he is as part of the Trinity. Jesus knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows you so intimately. There's no doubt he probably knows where the fish are at. That's why my son prays to him every time he goes bass fishing. Show me the fish. And here Jesus steps into this boat. This master fisherman who's done it almost all his own life, probably picked it up from his father because that's how trades were passed along back in this period of time, in this culture. You did what your father did. So, you know, we probably can suspect that Peter might have saw his father, even his grandfather, fishing. He's been on this lake for, for his whole life. And here comes this teacher. Okay, I'll let you use my boat so you can go out and be heard by your friends and I'll listen. Hey, Peter, drop your net right here. Go, go out a little further, but drop it right in here. You know, I've been working all night, Jesus, and, and my partners and I have been working hard. But because you know so. And you know what's running through his mind. You don't know the first thing about fishing. And of course, we know how the story goes. But let's take that and move it into your life. Jesus comes into your life. Jesus meets you. You meet him. Even today, What do we say to him? Take this step of faith with me, he calls each one of us. Let's go to this place and do this thing. Will you speak to this person for me? Will you be a witness in this land for me? Will you go and serve me? And it, Well, Lord, you, you, you don't understand me. You really don't know who you're talking to. I, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of person, Jesus Jesus does know exactly who you are. He knows the exact circumstances of your life. And he's prepared. He's prepared for you to have a big haul if you're just willing to drop your doubt a little bit. I found some fun uh, quotes about skepticism. Albert Einstein said, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. I think that that's wise. Blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Sam Harris, who is uh, agnostic, at least probably an atheist, wrote a letter called, or wrote a book called Letter to a Christian Nation. I know of no society in human history that ever suffered because its people became too desirous of evidence in support of their core beliefs. We need to know what we believe and who we believe in. Now, Mr. Harris wants to criticize America as a Christian nation, but I think he makes a good point our society has learned less and less biblical knowledge because it's being further and further removed from the schools and because we as churches haven't done our best at going out and sharing the gospel. It used to be that people actually taught the Bible in public schools back in the day when public education first began. Because the Bible was something that many people had at home. It may have been the only book your family 
had. So you could take a child and tell them to go home and read. And they could. And so for many people over many generations, the Bible was an essential part of their education. They knew the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You could tell them something like, do you know where Mount Pisgah is? And they would be able to say yes. You can ask your pastor today. He's going to shake his head and say, I'm going to have to go look that up. How many of you know where Mount Pisgah is? And don't just say Israel. <laughs> you know, okay. There are things that, you know, Einstein also said something really interesting. Somebody went to him one day and said, what's your phone number? And he went over to the desk, picked up a phone book and looked it up. <laughs> and they thought that was crazy. He said, you're a genius and with an IQ that's above most people. He says, yeah, why do I want to waste time putting something in there I can look up? Okay, well, that's the way my life is. Actually, my life is just that I probably forgot what I know. <laughs> How many of you have figured that out by now, too? You've forgotten most of what you've known. Finally, John Paul Sartre. Okay, famous author. I was speaking of a friend, and he said this. She believed in nothing. Only her skepticism kept her from being an atheist. She believed nothing, but only her skepticism kept her from being an atheist. We have a hard time believing sometimes. And I'm going to get into reasons why we have a hard time believing sometimes, but I think at the core of it, it's who are you, Jesus? Who are you? Are you really that loving as people tell me? Do you really care about me like people say you do? Did you really give your life on the cross for me? And then we respond to that because we know who we are. Why would God love me? I'm not that good a person. Why would God love me? Because I'm not successful. Why would God love me? Because I don't do this, that, or the other thing. Why would God love me? Maybe if it were dependent upon you, the question or the answer would be different. But it isn't. It's dependent upon God's character. Not on us. He loves you. Because he does. We need to be a little skeptical about our faith. There's a story of an encounter of a man with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 19, verse, or chapter 9, verse 14 through 29. You might remember this one. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with them? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Today, teacher, I have brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes at the teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the demon or the spirit, but they could not. And Jesus replies, you unbelieving generation. It's interesting, the word unbelieving here is akin to skepticism. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long will I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and the spirit saw Jesus. It immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I want to stop there just for a moment. 
Because there have been circumstances, I'll bet, in your life, I know there have been in my life, where I wondered if Jesus could do anything. And I don't rack that up to a lack of faith. I lack that, rack that up to my inability to understand the depths of God's love. Because again, I let myself get in there. Intellectually, I let myself get in there and say, are there miracles? Do they really happen? Did they ever really happen? People have read this passage of Scripture, and you know what they describe it as? Well, this kid has epilepsy. Okay? It's, a, it's a natural. You know, the, the ancient world couldn't explain what was happening to this kid. It was a medical condition. I think Jesus would have answered it in a medical way, healed in a different way, had it been that. I believe that this world is spiritual and that there are evil spirits. And Jesus addresses it here. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I hear something in that too. He not only wants the healing and help for his son, he wants it for himself. And that's okay. Jesus replies, if I can, question mark. If I can, Jesus said. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And Jesus heals the boy. Sometimes we just need to stop and recognize it's not outside the possibility of what God can do. It's outside the possibility of our ability to fully comprehend God's power. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, I don't take unbelief or skepticism or doubt as a lack of faith. I think it's saying, I recognize who I am. I am not capable of having the kind of faith that you, Jesus, know about yourself. That you know about God. I, though, want to be there. And I want it for myself, and I want it for my son. Christians have all sorts of doubts in this world. We've been exposed to all sorts of things that challenge us. And it's hard not to live in this current world, in this current culture, with our current educational systems, and not have doubts, and not to be skeptical, especially when we consider the issue of science. I like to say that science is the reverse engineering of God's work. God, who created everything, set everything in order, we are discovering daily new things about mental health, physical health, about the climate, about the world. We are constantly discovering new things because we are gaining in our public and corporate knowledge. But we can't dismiss God from the equation. And that's unfortunately what people who deal a lot of times in science want us to do because they have one problem. They can't prove what they can't see. Now, on one hand, they they do that all the time. I mean, you you and I can't see the, the molecular level, but there are tests and things that they can do to demonstrate that these things exist and so forth. But faith in God are something that have to happen in a very different way. They say that's a crutch and that we are ignorant or uneducated because we do believe. 
Christians struggle with this. We struggle with all sorts of issues when it comes down to science and the way that we understand life. A former Southern Baptist described the various good things that God promised but failed to do in his life when he decided to no longer be a Christian. And he goes to the scriptures and he says, God promises me a lot in the Bible and he's not come through. Ask and it shall be given and I didn't get. Follow me and I will bless you and I didn't feel blessed. I promise you life and promise abundance and yet I'm poor. Man should not be alone and I'm divorced. I have a plan for you. I just don't see it. Give tithe and I will reward you. I did and my pockets are empty. All broken promises. This God lacks clarification. This God lacks faith in me. He wants my faith. I want his too. I have to say that is a very discouraging testimony, if you will. Sad that this man feels this way. But if we want fewer people to feel this way, then I think we need to be smart about our Christian faith. Christians and Christians. If we want people to see the true hope that's there, to experience life, to know that God does fulfill his promises, then we need to be people who also live by those promises. See them and know them and be able to articulate why we know them to be true. We overcome this by, first of all, being careful about being hypocritical. More people are injured and hurt in their faith by the way we, as the Christian church, we, as Christian individuals, live our lives in the public sphere. We need to be careful of being hypocritical. Second thing that people oftentimes struggle with is an issue of pain, personal hurt, fear, disease, and even death. And as Christians, we need to have an answer and a knowledge about these things, not just simple platitudes about them. I think the most powerful stories in my life that I have recalled and used when I'm going through difficulties are of friends who walked through hard times and yet came out the other side and were able to exclaim that God was good. That might seem a little over simple or a little simplified, but I don't consider going through life's challenges and difficulties easy, but I have a God who makes them easier to get through. And I need to give him glory and praise for when he takes me through those times. Because if I simply go through them and say, well, yeah, I had a bad cold last week. Well, that says nothing. Well, I had a bad cold last week, but God was with me. Thank him for getting me through that. Thank him that it didn't turn into pneumonia. Thank him for all sorts of good things. Those times when we've been through personal struggle and heartache and injury and pain, disease, there were people who were there for you. And there was one that was there for you that loves you and knows you in the person of Jesus Christ. We also have to be careful, though, not just to give people stock answers or to over-promise. I think there's more injurious episodes in people's lives when we simply look at them sort of the way we say, hi, how are you, without stopping to actually listen for an answer. 
How you doing? I, oh, I know you. Hey, having a good day? And we walk right by, don't we? We don't spend much time listening. The great story and lesson of the book of Job at the end is when God chastens his good friends for giving too much advice and not just simply sitting and listening to their hurting friend. Standard pat answers can include statements such as, God will never put more on you than you can bear. Boy, there have been times when I've thought, who does God think he's dealing with? (laughs) God works in mysterious ways. Yes, he does, but I'd like to, for him to get real specific right now. It was God's will. Your faith wasn't strong enough. Boy, that's one that feels so judgmental to me. How do we describe somebody else's faith? The one that I've seen and I've watched crush a family... God wanted him in heaven. You know, we wanted him here too. God is testing you. Stand firm. I know that the scriptures speak about God testing us from time to time, but That's one that I just wonder sometimes if we can't just leave alone and let God be the one who answers that on the other side of eternity. Reminding people that God's love is here for them each and every day, that he sees them and knows them and loves them. And most importantly, the reason I'm talking to you and standing in front of you, my friend, at this moment of your need is because God has moved me to show my love to you and to witness his love to you too. And it doesn't have to be said, it can be hugged. There's more healing in a hug than oftentimes all the words that we can say. In the touch of a gentle hand, the side of hospital bed. There is more done for the kingdom of God than most of the preaching that occurs on a Sunday morning. Which really stinks because my job security goes out the window if you guys would just go love people. And along with me. We are told, though, to test every spirit. Skepticism is a sign of a healthy ego, mind, and faith. I'll tell you, there's nothing more that I dislike than having a pastor tell me that he has told me what the Bible says. Many years ago, I had a conflict with a student at my school, and I went to seek different people's opinions because Scripture also tells us their wisdom. Wisdom resides in the counsel of many. So I'm listening to several people, you know, Tell me a little bit about how I should handle this situation. To a person, each person said, you need to go do this. Go to the dean of students, report the situation, do this, do this, do this. I went to this pastor, and he said, you need to let it go, forgive it, da-da-da-da-da. And the funny thing was, I was like, oh, this is the only guy who said this. This was unique and different. I thought, wow, this really got me. And then he said, so what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to go home and pray. (laughs) That's when he hits me with, I'm the pastor. I told you what to do. All of a sudden, I'm stepping back a little bit going, you know what? I I was with you. I really was. I was with you. Forgive, let it go. But now I think that that was more out of your personal ego than it was the Word of God. And it made me step back for a while. It took me a little extra time to pray. (laughs) But I ended up doing what he said. 
But I realized, you know what, that's, that's not the way this works. What works is when we as individuals listen to one another, search the word, pray, and then discover God's will. 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. Realize, one, the difference between omniscience and non-omniscience. God is all-knowing. We are not, no matter who you may be talking to. A great theologian, an incredible orator, or even me. We are not the be-all and end-all. God is. That's why we seek Him. And we listen to one another because God's Spirit does speak through us. He speaks through you just as He speaks through me. But not one of us has a corner on that market. It has to be Him. He knows. Realize that No one has all the answers. You don't, I don't, only God does. And therefore, if, number three, you take a humble attitude with others and you listen, God may, he just may not be as silent as sometimes you feel he is. Because he often does speak through people who love you and are concerned for you. Number three, I just want to say, don't be gloomy. You know, I think it's healthy to be skeptical. Just don't be gloomy about it. There is hope. There is something good. There is something wonderful in everything, even if it's flawed. The church is flawed, but I love being here because, you know, I look at you and how messed up you are. It makes me feel good about how messed up I am. I'm not, there's hope here. My wife is shaking her head saying, no, there's not. (laughs) No, she didn't. Just give me that look, though. Keep going. Okay. (laughs) Sometimes Christians are gloomy because they see the world going to hell in a handcart. We have flu epidemics, a deep recession, gridlock in Congress, global warming, and a culture that worships sex and money. There's lots to be gloomy about. But we have hope. Because once in a while we find a vaccine that cures something. We have hope because there are always new elections. We have hope because another ice age is coming. We have hope because Christ is bigger than our culture. St. Paul, on the other hand, reminds us when he writes in Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Don't let your skepticism overcome your faith. Use it, though, as a tool that helps to harden and strengthen it. And then I want to leave you with this last quote from Timothy Keller, who wrote the book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept that he said, all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then don't worry about what he said. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teachings, but whether or not he rose from the dead. This is an answer that you have to look at and the question you have to answer for yourself. You may not understand everything that the Bible teaches. You may not like everything that comes at you in life, but there is one thing you have to answer. If Jesus is God, how are you going to respond to him? Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Father, in our doubt, come to us and help us. But I pray, Father, that you would not only help us, but that you would show yourself to us in new ways that help reaffirm our faith and our knowledge about who Jesus Christ, the resurrected, promised Messiah, 
that you would help us discover him and fall deeper in love with him and hear his voice and to follow his leading. Help us as a church, but also help us as individuals. Help us when we are in those moments of doubt and darkness, Father, and lead us when we are in those times of sunshine and joy and light. Father, thank you that uh, Peter wasn't cast away because he had doubt. Thank you, Father, that you answered the prayers of this man whose son was, was hurting, both who were skeptical, both who didn't answer the way we are taught to answer. And help us, Lord, when we don't always know if you're there. Help us to feel you and to hear you and to have a hand of a friend, a fellow believer that comes along and says, yes, it's real. Thank you, Father, for your love for us this morning and bless you this day. We glorify your name, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand.